against the Muslims who have transgressed any law of Allah. And both of these are deviated and, and misinterpreted in, according to their own desires and emotions. So this is the far-reaching effects of Al-Muhajir. Let me tell you something more. Do you remember when <coughs> President Sadat was assassinated? In the 80s. The late 80s, I believe. Or early 80s. 82. Or 79. So around, around that sort of time. Those people, Islam Budi, who were behind this, who have the same methodology, where they deviated from these two principles, excommunication of Muslims out of the religion of Islam, especially the leaders of the Muslim countries, and the obligation of rebelling against the state. Cast your mind back in 1975, at Juhaymi. In 1975, he took over the Kaaba, surrounded the Kaaba, which is the most holy place in Islam for the Muslims. And he called for everybody to give, to give their, their oath and leadership to him and to fight the, the leaders of, of, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That's 1975. So we saw, we saw an example of 2000, example of the 80s, example of 1975, just three examples. Each one of these individual cases, they all had the, had the same corrupt methodology in this issue of excommunicating Muslims from the religion and the obligation of rebellion against the Muslim lands. And this is exactly what al muhajirun are calling to now. Now you think, well, okay, all these examples happen in the Muslim lands. Well, we're not in the Muslim lands. We're in a non-Muslim land here, yeah, so we're safe. No, you're not entirely safe. The reason why is because one of, another one of their principles is that they will speak their mind without considering the consequences of their actions and speech. This is something which is engraved in their methodology, in their understanding. They believe if they do not speak their mind that they will be sinful or that they will be transgressing against the rules of Islam. Which again, in this issue again, is another heretical distortion of this religion. Because Islam asks us to weigh out the consequences of our speech before we speak and make sure that the, har that the harms do not outweigh the benefits before we speak. These people have no principles in this regard. And this is why we witness from them the inflammatory remarks such as, we hope London gets nuked. We hope that there is a bigger bomb here than Bali. And then, I don't know if you cast your mind, I cast your mind back in 2001, after 9-11. The media focused on no Muslims but them on, in Luton specifically. And they had placards shouting, Jihad, 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 we'll kill you, we will, we will do this to you, we will do that to you, and so on and so forth. They would say, we have war, they openly declared war against this country. And they were residing here, taking the dole benefit, the housing benefit, council houses, and living under the protection of this country. So my dear respected guests, this is just to give you a glimpse of the far-reaching effects of what their methodology they're upon can have in um, repercussion to the, to the societies of, of Great Britain. Having said that, do bear in mind that they are a tiny minority, and that's the good news. They are being uh, contained by people like yourselves and us working together in the best way possible. So is there anyone else that? Okay, I think inshallah, that should be sufficient given the time and the space. Um, I now would like to ask um, so the, uh, the speakers, the funny speakers, to come and give us a five-minute sort of summary of what the way they feel is the way forward <coughs> in tackling extremism, <coughs> not just amongst the Muslims, but also the far right. Um, so I'd like to first and foremost... <coughs>